kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war. Hang on. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing Kill and Kill Again on May 8th, 1981. It was written by John Crowther, directed by Ivan Hall, and released by Film Ventures International. In 1976, South African martial arts film Karate Olympiad was released, and in 1980, it got a limited release in the U.S. under the title Karate Killer, and was later retitled Kill or Be Killed. The first film is about a disgraced Nazi officer hiding out in South Africa who wagers in diamonds against a Japanese businessman that he has cultivated the world's greatest fighters. Steve Hunt, with a different last name for some reason, <laughs> has been captured and trained by the Nazis' South African compound, but escapes to fight for the Japanese businessman, and in the final match is forced to fight his fiancée in a battle to the death. But we'll come back to how that goes at the end. Fun fact, the Japanese businessman is named Mr. Miyagi, pre-Karate Kid, and one of his fighters catches a fly with chopsticks. Yeah, but is that like saying, this guy is named Mr. Smith, as is other people named Mr. Smith? I've like... <laughs> only heard two Miyagis so far. Is that an unusual name? I don't know. I don't know either. I just mean, thought I, I just thought the combination of having a Mr. Miyagi and having a guy yeah, I guess catch, catch a fly with I don't know maybe that's something they do a lot in Japan. Is uh is this is this film also South African? Yes. Oh, they don't sound South African. They sound very ADR'd. Yeah, they're oh, dubbed over. They're dubbed over. Okay. <laughs> The short run was very well received, and Film Ventures International quickly greenlit a sequel to be titled Kill and Kill Again. Film Ventures International had at one point announced an intention to produce as many as four sequels. Steve Chase actor James Ryan turned down an offer for additional films to return to South Africa for the birth of his son. Because the franchise did not continue in his absence, he later came back and signed back onto the franchise. A purported third installment had been announced with the titles Kill or Be Killed 3 or The Most Dangerous Man, but sadly, neither came to be because 81 was a very difficult year for FVI. Sadly? Sadly. Mm. They had just bought distribution rights to an Italian Jaws ripoff called Great White, starring James Franciscus and Vic Morrow, and spent $4 million on an American marketing campaign, which succeeded only in attracting the legal team of Universal Pictures. <laughs> who successfully forced the film to be pulled from theaters a week into its American release. A different type of shark was drawn. Yes. These losses, coupled with the poor performance of a 1984 title Mutant and the pending divorce settlement of FVI founder Edward L. Montoro, drove Montoro to take the last million dollars of the company's holdings and flee the country. He was never seen again. <laughs> Do you remember the last time somebody fleed the country yeah. with the money from a film? Do we know, Richard? I know it. I, I don't know it. I'll give you a clue. It was a horrendous Jerry Lewis movie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that could be anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be any of them. <laughs> um, I don't even remember what the title of that movie Hardly was. Hardly working. working. Oh, man. That, I, I burned that out of my memory. This installment of this franchise has a Rift Tracks episode devoted to it. Oh. I thought I'd maybe watch that later. I guess that explanation of the origin of this film kind of answers my first question before we even get into this. I couldn't tell if this movie was a joke or not. Like, for a large portion of the movie, I think towards the end I was like, oh no, that was that was in earnest. Um, but I, I think was some like, of it's oh, real it's, and some of it's a joke. I don't know. I thought it was like, I think sometimes they try to be funny, but like at first I thought it was like a parody movie. But oh, okay. I don't think it's a parody movie. No, I don't movie. think it's a parody <laughs> movie. But I, I think it is done tongue-in-cheek a lot of the time. Okay. We start with Maurice Binder-style optical effects, shimmering opening credits over silhouetted martial arts. Uh, interesting credit at the start, Ken Gampu as Gorilla. I was like, wait, as a gorilla or as a, as someone <laughs> named Gorilla? Um, but the, uh, the, the opening titles for the first film are very similar to this. They're being projected on a body doing karate. Yeah. And it's it looks like... 
obviously they were trying to get people to like or who was who's I don't know if this is our main character doing the actual moves. But yeah. They're like, okay, do a move that will conveniently put one of your body parts dead center on the screen and then hold it very still for a while. So that we can put a name <laughs> right there. I thought for a moment these silhouettes were getting very graphic until I realized that it was a karate belt that was hanging between the legs <laughs> of the silhouetted fighter. I, I was absolutely going to say that exact thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, maybe you could unloosen that gi yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the reasons traditionally these credits are usually done in this style with women. And in swimsuits and stuff like yeah. that, so there's not dangling parts to confuse the eye. Picture opens at the Sun City International Martial Arts Confederation. They're awarding martial arts trophies. We cut to a man in a tuxedo shouting karate sounds loudly in a dark lounge area and taking on all comers. Everyone who comes out gets launched in another direction. Eventually, the man does a backflip over a partition down onto a casino floor below. He beats up another man and then yanks the arm of the slot machine scoring a jackpot for the young blonde woman playing. The man continues fighting people outside the casino and up onto the balcony and the woman he scored the jackpot for continues following him. Who are all these people who are attacking him? We'll get to that. We come back to the man handing out the trophies for the Confederation as he wraps up a speech introducing this year's winner, Steve Chase. Just as the judge gets to Mr. Chase's name, the Tuxedo Man and his fight arrive at the award ceremony, and it turns out Mr. Tuxedo is Steve Chase himself. Even after winning, he continues fighting people, overturning buffets, Knocking innocent bystanders into a pool. Yeah, I was like, dude, what? They look pretty ready to be pushed in. Yeah. <laughs> and this uh, this MC uh, was like, he was like somehow a combination of James Coburn and Peter O'Toole. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, is this guy someone I know? And I'm just like, he's not even credited. Yeah. I was like, I don't know who this is, but he yeah. looks like a bunch of people I know. He's very Coburn y. Everyone laughs and applauds him for his actions, but even Chase seems annoyed to be here as he's handed a trophy by a showgirl. I really hate these affairs. What kind of affairs do you like? The kind you were simply suited for. The gambler woman finally catches up with him and thanks him. A representative of the hotel informs Chase that he will have to pay for the damage he did, but the gambler woman says that she'll pay the tab because he saved her from the men fighting on the casino floor. Chase tells the woman, who he correctly identifies as Candy Kane, that he knows that she arranged this entire fight. She admits that it was a test of his skill and he passed. I guess I missed that line. Yeah. So <laughs> she hired all these people to attack him at the ceremony. Just to prove himself. Right. But what if he killed somebody? I think he did. It was worth it. Chase follows Candy to her suite at the casino to continue their conversation. In her suite... Chase asks Candy Kane if she's related to the missing Nobel Prize winning scientist Horatio Kane. He's my father. I think it's weird that he has to ask if she's related to the Nobel Prize winner when he's the one who recognized her as Candy Kane. Yeah. Although, I guess there could be a, a line that comes in towards the end of the movie that maybe he's just trying to grill her. But then, is she Candy Kane? I don't Are, even know if she is Candy Kane. I would say no, she is not. It's weird that he recognizes her as Candy Cane outside the hotel, and here he's asking if she's related to the scientist Dr. Horatio Cane. I thought maybe reflecting back on that line towards the end of the movie, because there's a bit of dialogue that explains that he might have some doubts as to her identity. Right. And so it's possible he's trying to see if she'll mess up if she says something wrong. Oh, like he's testing her knowledge of the real Candy Cane? Correct. Because we're assuming she's not Candy Cane. Right, but like he, the reason he knows her is because he looked at like the hotel register. Right. So. Oh, okay. So he knows that that name is associated with this person. He doesn't necessarily know what she looks like. Why does he know it's associated with this person? Did he see her sign it in the register? I don't, I don't know that he just made he just looked it up. But I maybe he knew what room she was in. I don't know. Yeah, because it seems like it's like okay, if you know who Candy Kane is, yeah. Then the only way you could identify her is you if you had any like visual information and she doesn't look like yeah, the I don't woman think, we see at the end I of the film. I don't think he recognized her. I think he investigated he's, her and 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 surmised that this is Candy yeah, Kane. He's playing into her her trick. Yeah. There's a lot of things that happen through exposition. Yeah. In this movie like that are just explained away like 
uh, later, <laughs> and yeah. and I feel like this is one of those moments. Do you guys recall the last time that we had a character creepily get a woman's name from a hotel registry? Uh, somewhere in time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was before the movie I'm thinking of, oh. but I, I'm fuzzy on the order now. I don't know. Flash Gordon is what I was thinking of. I don't even remember I, them signing into a hotel. Yeah, I don't remember. A when hotel they get at all. on that <laughs> private plane together in the beginning, he knows her name already, and he says, "I saw your mm. your name on the register." Oh, uh, okay. While they talk, Chase is searching the room for bugs. He drags a finger across a piano and recognizes a single key that doesn't sound right. He lifts it out of the piano and removes the small electronic device from underneath it. We cut to the man listening on a reel-to-reel in a dark room somewhere. Chase holds the mic right next to the piano and smashes the keys with his fist to assault the eardrums of the eavesdropper. But wouldn't the striking striking of the keys, especially striking the key that the microphone is right above, even though it's not playing the note, it's still just thumping against the... Yeah. And we we, we went over this, I think, on uh, In Thief. Like, the handling of the bug would be a clear giveaway, especially if someone is actively listening. Yeah, you would take your headphones off immediately as yeah, soon as you it, know they found as soon, it. As soon as you're like, I mean, I'm sure most of our audiences never picked up a, a live microphone while listening to it. Right. But but it sounds like you're rubbing sandpaper across something. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very a noticeable sound. Yeah. Chase drops the mic in Candy's champagne. The bug deactivated. Candy tells him what her father was up to and why he was taken. My father has been working for several years on a project to extract fuel from potatoes. One year's crop can provide enough gasoline to drive every car in the world to the moon. Solve the parking problem. Mr. Chase, this is no laughing matter. So how big a, a crop are we talking, first of all? Yeah, it's is so... This per potato? So this was a lot of information. I had to pause it here because this was a lot of oh, information. I'm glad you paused it here because then it won't ups itself so crazily. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, because I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, that's totally something to kidnap somebody order. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Like, OPEC's going to be up in arms against but this. Chase nope. doesn't think so. You know, like, this is, this is absolutely worth kidnapping somebody and preventing that from getting out. But Chase is like, that... that he doesn't think an alternative fuel could cause all this commotion. And then she she elaborates. During his research, my father accidentally discovered there was a byproduct. An incredible new mind control drug that enables whoever administers it to bend people to his will. So we've essentially set up a cross between the formula and scanners. <laughs> yeah. He laughs so hard at this secondary thing that actually caused his yeah. kidnapping. It's not the fuel source. It's the... Yeah. It's the Potato mind, mind control, control juice. Drug. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you, I feel like you have to pick one or the other. Yeah, because every car in the world from here to the moon enough fuel from a. I think she says. I think the term she uses is a single crop. And I, yeah, but what is a single crop? Yeah, like, like, like one small field, or, or like all if you the were, world's crop, all the world's potatoes for one year <laughs> right i'm not willing to make that sacrifice if yeah. it means i, I can't have french, french fries, fries for a yeah. year i mean i like the moon where is that engine that runs on walnuts or <laughs> faberge eggs and yeah. bald eagle heads <laughs> that's one of my favorite snl jokes of all time new scientist magazine reported on wednesday that in the future cars could be powered by hazelnuts that's encouraging uh, considering an eight ounce jar of hazelnuts costs about nine dollars <laughs> Yeah, I got an idea for a car that runs on bald eagle heads and Fabergé eggs. Room service shows up with a bottle of champagne, but Candy points out that she's already holding one. I've already received it. Chase is suspicious and throws the bottle out the hotel window where it explodes. Must have been domestic. Chase opens the door and drags the room service man back into the suite to beat him up. (laughs) Was he just standing by the door? Yeah, he just with his fingers in his ears like a cartoon. (laughs) That's exactly what I was thinking. It's just like, why would you wait? You just put a bomb in there. Get away. Get out. Eventually, the room service guy escapes, and Chase kicks open a door to an adjoining room where he finds four older gentlemen and immediately subdues them all. Candy informs him that these men are here to help find her father. He's being held in a small village in the mountains where everyone is under the power of the mind control potato drug. The old men tell Chase that the fate of the planet is at stake, and they have lots of money to pay him to solve the problem. Shall we say two million plus expenses? 
five million. I'll pick up my own expenses. He says he'll need four men on his team, but that Candy Cane cannot be a part of the rescue mission. But he says this unprompted, like nobody has suggested yeah. that she would be a part of the team yet. And he, on his own, says, by the way, she's not on the team. But I think that's because he knows that she's not who she says she is. Or at least he will claim to. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. she also, right here, like, looks at the men like, oh, God, is this throwing a wrench into our planes that he's not inviting me? We get a harsh music sting as Chase stomps through the suite and out of the hotel room. <laughs> but it's literally from him stepping on the destroyed piano on the ground. <laughs> I, I liked that moment, though. We cut to a karate school where hundreds of children are being run through an exercise. Chase approaches the instructor in the center of the group and says he's looking for the fly. The man points him in the direction of Sensei Tanaka, the master of masters. He knows where the fly is. Why did we need to have two masters here? Why yeah. not? You know, <laughs> Just keep them coming. Because it didn't make a difference. <laughs> We cut to Chase finding Sensei Tanaka immediately, <laughs> leading a rooftop karate class downtown. I'm here to see the fly. He has found Satori. You mean he knows I'm searching for him? Yes. I must find him, Sensei. Be careful. So Satori is apparently like enlightenment. Oh... I didn't bother to look it up. <laughs> and it comes with something like omniscience, I guess. Chase crosses the rooftop to a doorway, and the door opens a full second before Chase raises his arm to knock on it. You'd think he'd have, like, faster reflexes, because the door's already partway open when he mm -hmm. starts to raise his arm, and it's like, is this guy a ninja? Well, so I thought it was a little weird that he has this, like, telepathic power to like move things i i don't really understand why this never comes back it's not chase doing it it's the fly doing it <laughs> no i understand yeah. that but again spoiler alert right, the fly right, right. does join us for the rest of the movie and we do not use his uh telekinesis ever again <laughs> it only works on certain doors <laughs> he's really just an illusionist he's not a, he yeah. doesn't have any special powers he turns to look back at Tanaka, amused at this trick of using telepathy to open a door, and then steps through it. The door closes again just as it opened without anyone touching it. He enters another room with another automatic door that looks like a loft. Chase watches from across the room as the fly strikes a match with his foot and lights a candle with it. Then, the man slides impossibly across the room left to right without ever lifting his feet from the ground. Somehow, Chase can see that the fly is not interested in joining the team. The two spar for a moment without ever making contact with each other. The fly suggests that in a battle like the one Chase has taken on, that both sides will suffer casualties. The fly darts out of the room and jumps over the side of the building from the rooftop, climbing precariously down the side. Chase struggles kicking open the magic doors. He winds up a spinning kick, and the door completely fractures in half like it's cardboard inside. And it looks like it is. It is. <laughs> but that's not unusual. A cardboard core door. Yeah. The fly is already 10 stories down the side of the building, crossing the street in the middle of traffic. It reminded me of uh, Shaft recently. Yeah. He's just wandering out in front of the cars. But it's funny because it looks like he's retreating. Like he's just like, nope, I'm too scared. Bye. <laughs> and he's just running through traffic. We cut to a construction site as Chase arrives. He watches one shirtless man play tug of war against a team of seven construction workers. And he manages to pull them all into the puddle between them. Suddenly, another man grabs the opposite end of the rope. And the strong man recognizes his friend. Steve Chase, you son of a god. I'm definitely getting MacGruber vibes from this whole sequence yeah. Yeah. of him getting the team together. MacGruber? I thought you were dead. <laughs> ah, last time I saw you, you had a grenade launcher in one hand and an M16 in the other. And you had just ripped a dude's throat out with your bare hands. Classic MacGruber. I was hearing that song yeah. playing in my head the whole time. Dun, Playing dun, with dun. the devil, it's touch and go. We mentioned that recently. I forget why. That I think the composer did one of our movies recently. Chase yanks his friend into the mud puddle before telling him about the job. The man is preemptively disinterested, telling Steve that he already has a job doing construction now and that he's banned from wrestling for biting the ears off of everyone he beats. Apparently this is Gorilla from the opening credits, and he actually seems happy with his work here. And besides, it has got, uh, what do you call it? Security? Yeah, that's the word. Yeah, but I never thought I'd hear you say it. I didn't. You did. I actually like that joke. 
The foreman walks over to give Gorilla shit for wasting the time of his entire crew, and Gorilla realizes he doesn't want this job after all. The two argue over whether he's fired or quit, until Gorilla throws the foreman in the same mud puddle, and then gives Chase a big hug to soil his outfit with mud. I was like, well, why would you, why would you quit? If you get fired, you can, you can collect unemployment. Yeah, yeah to fund a, this mission. This is a theme of the 80s. I don't know if maybe unemployment didn't have this, uh, this uh, rule back in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> we cut to Chase wandering a junkyard looking for someone named Gypsy Billy, and he pays an old man a few bucks for information on where to find him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is wasted money. Because <laughs> I was laughing so hard. I was like, when when I see him hand the money over, was like, was that just two dollars folded over to make it look like it was more than two dollars? <laughs> yeah, nope, no, it's just, no, it was just two bucks. And first of all, walk through the place once yeah. to see if maybe you can spot the guy before you pay someone money to find him. How's that truck? First alley on the left. Chase finds a trailer with the words "Gypsy, ex champion of the world" spray painted spray across the side. <laughs> it's like, man, yeah, that could have taken a couple a couple bucks off of your budget. <laughs> He finds Jip passed out on a bed in the school bus. It should be noted that they call him Jip. That is not our choice. Right. Is that an offensive term? Yes. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Also, Gorilla is not super friendly either for the big black character on the team. Also, the fly. I mean, yeah. So Uh, we didn't mention it before, but he was—he's technically a mosquito. No, he's a human. He finds Jip passed out on a bed in the school bus, and when Jip pretends to be retired, Steve yanks him by an arm and throws him out of the vehicle to join the team. Chase drags him through the trailer park and past the man who owns the place out front. Jip demands his security deposit back before they leave, and he gives them the same $2 he took from Chase a minute ago, having deducted $3 from Jip's $5 security deposit for damage. I actually think that's fair, because they destroy a lot of stuff on their way out of this little (laughs) junkyard area. It's worth at least three bucks, but it's funny that he had a $5 security deposit. Like that time that the landlady kept hundreds of dollars of mine because I didn't wash the sheets. <laughs> you want the sheets? When Jip gets physical asking for the rest of his money, the man whistles for his trailer park backup and a bunch of hillbillies race across the park. Jip uses the opportunity like a warm-up and quickly beats up all four or five attackers. Jip realizes that he actually is ready for battle and accepts Chase's invitation. Chase and his team are given a slideshow of Ironville, the town where Dr. Kane is being held captive. These are satellite photos from a satellite that Candy's old men bought from NASA. Who are these guys again? <laughs> They're just people with money. Yeah, they can buy they can buy satellites from NASA, uh, w- which is, like, fine, but you specifically bought satellites from NASA that can also photograph, right. like, really close. Uh, here they mention specifically that the potato fuel can give you 1,000 miles per gallon fuel efficiency. That's not enough to get to the moon. Sorry, guys. Well, really, she did She did say the whole crop would have enough. The men ask Chase if he's heard of Wellington Forsyth III. A billionaire who dropped out of sight years ago. Supposedly lost on an archaeological expedition. He calls himself Marduk now, after the Babylonian god. He's managed to attract an impressive number of followers and... Uh, Oh, thanks to Candy's father and his discovery, he now holds the entire city under his control. Including Dr. Kane himself. Candy's worried that the government will try to stage a rescue and screw it up getting her father killed. This is weird, but we'll come back to that at the end. Chase asks how they've gotten so many close-up photos of Marduk, and one of the men explains that Marduk has a weakness for attractive women and they've implanted one in his camp as a photographer. Why is he allow anybody to be taking photographs in this camp at no all? No idea. And and why does he not just immediately mind control anyone that he wants that's new? Yeah, why isn't she being injected constantly with the mind control? Yeah, so. I mean, I think that we do get a, a sense of that later that he has an elite squad that he doesn't right. do mind control with and and, and the I, people who he should be controlling the most, he chooses not to control at all. Yeah. But I would have like an interview process in which I <laughs> inject them with the mind control drug and then say, "Are you here on behalf of the government?" <laughs> yeah, do you work for anyone else? <laughs> That's a good idea, Richard. You could be a good evil genius. That's right. You're going to be our Marduk. <laughs> well, and and so and also, I I was immediately I'm I'm sus of everyone in this group 
uh, including his own men. Yeah. Once you introduce the, the concept that people can be under mental manipulation and you don't establish the rules or the boundaries yet. Then the of, mole could be anybody. Exactly. It could yeah. be absolutely anybody. The old men offer the use of their private jet to get as close as possible to Ironville, and the team will have to hike from there. Gorilla thinks the job sounds more complicated than advertised and suggests they try to find Hot Dog to add him to the team. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to get Hot Dog. The rich guy asks Chase to reconsider leaving Candy out of the operation, and he tells them to fuck off. <laughs> and again, Candy's like, oh, oh, I should be on the team. We cut to the camp where the attractive female spy takes pictures for the rich dudes. In the center of a sand pit, one of Marduk's most powerful fighters takes on four men alone. At the end of the fight, Marduk, with his ridiculous fake beard, congratulates <laughs> the man for proving himself once again. 100% real beard, yeah. not a fake beard. <laughs> I thought he was just one of those guys that has a really weird looking beard. No. You think it's fake? It's definitely fake. <laughs> but if you think about it, it'd still be a pretty cool party. <laughs> I'll bring the beards. <laughs> a woman with bright pink hair peeks around the corner and addresses Marduk by a cutesy nickname, a different nickname than Marduk. Honey child. What is it, Minerva? I have news, Angel Face. What news? And I wish you wouldn't call me those names. At least not in front of the ladies. The ladies? She informs Marduk that they have convinced Steve Chase to come here. Marduk is ecstatic to have a real challenger for his champion. Apparently, the rich guys are working for Marduk, like Mirage works for Syndrome. Are they sending him here? No, I don't think so. No, no. they're not. They're not. But that's what it seems like at this point it, in the film. Yes. I w was so confused by this because I was like, how do they know? How did they get him? Did they set this up? I they must just have eyes on him at all times. Maybe that's who was listening on the reel-to-reel, -reel, and there were, uh, there were other mics in this room, so they know what's being discussed. Yeah, but like... Were they just, like, how long have they been tailing Steve? and? Because like, it seems like they're targeting him specifically. Yeah, yeah. what did yeah. they do to encourage this to happen? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're just like, hey, that thing you wanted to happen, it's just it's, happening. It's just yeah. randomly it's happening. It's just happening magically. It just so We didn't do anything. That some random rich person uh, wants this guy that we kidnapped back and hired the dude we wanted to come here. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Minerva also delivers the message that Dr. Kane demands his presence, and they leave in a small helicopter together to see the scientist. Minerva follows Marduk into the building where the scientist is being held. Apparently, Dr. Kane summoned him here because he just learned from the news that he doesn't work here of his own free will <laughs> and he was kidnapped. He's like, hold on, CNN says uh, that you guys kidnapped me and that I'm being held prisoner here and I don't appreciate it. <laughs> Why did you kidnap me? I assure you, Dr. Kane, your fears are groundless. Marduk assures him that he came willingly and that together the two of them will save the planet. Evidently, the plan is to introduce this chemical into the world's water supply with the execution of the cleverly nicknamed Operation Water Supply. Another dose of the mind control chemical is administered to Dr. Kane, who informs Marduk that everything will be ready to go in five days. The world's water supply. Yeah. <laughs> A.K.A. the ocean. Just one drop in the ocean is enough to do it. All these fish are going to be like, what do you want us to do? <laughs> <laughs> he becomes Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor here kind of looks like Jared Harris. Marduk says that they need to bump up everyone's injections to every five days instead of weekly because he can't have people discovering they were kidnapped. Also, maybe put like a child lock on the television. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Marduk is disturbed at the thought that the doctor might have done something while he was free of mind control and orders Minerva to move the lab and check the building top to bottom. Chase and his boys approach a warehouse and inside they watch their next recruit, Hot Dog, as he plays a completely nonsense game. A group of men all tuck their bets into a silver platter and then one of them throws a gun at a wall which fires when it hits the ground, sending a bullet in a random direction. I'm reminded of the game that my brother and I patented in our college years called Ketchup Roulette, where <laughs> <laughs> where in a ketchup packet from a fast food restaurant is twisted once across the middle and then handed back and forth <laughs> between two competitors until such a time as the packet would erupt. 
This is the greatest ever. The fun part of catch-up roulette is that it doesn't matter who makes the final twist because everyone is always a target. (laughs) Hot Dog's friends reload the gun between turns and throw it into the air again. It fires and explodes one of their drinks on the table. Hot Dog snatches a cigarette butt from a friend's mouth and dips it in one of the glasses of liquor on the table, filter first, and then he inhales through the filter and it starts smoking again and then he hands it back to his friend he does this multiple times in the yeah. film and i have no idea what he's doing and then like i can't always tell is he going back to the the i don't know the butt end of it or is i he, think he is because i thought he like ate over like put his mouth over the uh the ash the ash end i don't know but that seems I, really gross i thought way, i thought he I have no I, idea why i thought he was sucking on the liquor end of yeah that's what i thought too. okay well maybe he was but again, why? I don't I don't get it. I don't understand what's happening here, and it happens again later. It's the only reason I wrote it down here is because it happened again a second time. Well, I mean, this could be like the precursor to uh, w- uh, like those college kids who take who vaporize alcohol and then suck it in. Oh, maybe. They continue to dump money into the pot. In round eight, a man takes a bullet in the knee and crawls across the floor, excusing himself from the game. I really wanted one of these bullets to just kill Steve Chase right in the middle <laughs> of a fucking movie. Like a reverse MacGruber situation where he gathers this whole team together and then he dies. Chase whistles for Hot Dog through a crack in the door and he comes out to greet his friends. Hot Dog addresses the glaring absence in the team. Well, the old gang together again. I never believed it would happen. All right, round number nine. Hey, but where's the fly? Oh, the fly's missing. Just as Hot Dog attempts to refuse Chase's invitation on account of the danger, the beer he's drinking explodes in his hand from round nine's bullet. Well, count me out, kid. Far out. You're too dangerous. Chase gestures for Gorilla to lift Hot Dog off the ground until he accepts the invitation and they all leave together. On the private jet, Hot Dog finds a box of tacks and dumps a handful into his pocket. He asks again how they'll rope the fly into joining the team, and Chase says he's achieved Satori and means that he can't fight anymore. Like, it seems like he's saying that he can't fight people or that he's above fighting. Gorilla tries to use the restroom on the plane and finds it occupied by the pilot. (laughs) He bangs on the door over and over and eventually bashes it in while the pilot is trying to take a dump. The (laughs) The flight attendant is furious to see that he's destroyed the bathroom on the plane. Please excuse him, ma'am. He's never flown in an airplane before. Oh, I thought maybe he'd never been let out of the zoo before. Well, actually, we uh, bribed his keeper. Somehow, Chase doesn't notice until now that Candy Cane is on the flight with them, even though there's only like 12 seats in this single compartment of the plane. Hot Dog starts hitting on her with Bogart's voice. It's pretty good, too. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't terrible. Hi, sweetheart. You included in the price of the ticket. Do you guys recall the last time someone was flirting in Bogart's voice? Is it the man with Bogart's face? Yeah, I, so. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask, do you remember the last time a movie tried to shoehorn in a celebrity impression just because the actor could do it well? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say Burt Reynolds <laughs> could do it well if you're talking about Rough Cut. Nope. Last time a celebrity impression. Oh, uh, Knight Riders? Yeah. The Marlon Brando? <laughs> that was pretty good, actually. Remember that night in a restaurant in a dark way to come on my table and he says, kids, this ain't your night. Chase reminds her that she's not invited and he won't go through with the mission with her on the plane. She tells him that she can lead him to the fly, but she can't make him join the team. We cross dissolve to the fly sitting in the middle of a rectangle of candles. He welcomes Steve to sit across from him and Steve enters frame and sits on a pillow across from him. I was like, oh, I thought they were about to have like a, a mind conversation, but he's actually here in the room with him. And so he sits down on a pillow in front of him. Chase tells the fly that they need his feet for this mission. But the fly insists that they'll need his brain too. It's like, well, yeah, no shit. You know what I meant. They're kind of attached. The fly levitates three or four feet in the air and then comes back down. Fly refuses him again and turns to pour him a glass of tea. But when he looks back, it's Chase's turn to levitate. How did you manage this illusion? Apparently, this is enough to sell the fly, and we cut to all five of them riding in a car through a field. Okay, so does that mean that Chase has also reached Centauri or whatever this is? Centauri. (laughs) For relaxing times. Make it Satori time. (laughs) What is it called? It's called Satori. Satori. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But does that that mean Chase is also there, or was he faking it? Or it was a trick. Okay. 
if you if you watch it on the blu-ray you can see how he's doing it <laughs> there's just a platform that lifts up that he's sitting on so but also like you guys have this skill that again you never use right after this moment <laughs> it only works a couple feet off the ground it's not like it would get them the whole way to the moon i was gonna make a an astronomy joke and say said that he reached agape ah he's just pronouncing grape wrong <laughs> oh, I thought it was talking about like the the sugar syrup. No, that's agave. <laughs> the team pulls over to take a break on the shore of a river. The fly asks why they brought a woman. Question: Why is the soft lady traveling with warriors to sew holes in socks? Candy insists she can hold her own, but Chase says that he's going to teach her some moves after she cooks them all breakfast because he's a stand-up guy. We cut back to Marduk's camp where he tells Minerva all about martial arts, even though presumably she already knows this. The entire population of the town where he set up shop is practicing karate around him. In the film's trailer, this army is referred to as Marduk's karate clones, but they're all just regular people. Yeah, but, okay, so they all do look like regular people. There's a mix of, you know, men and women, all sorts of races. Everybody's in here. Yeah, he's really progressive. they're all, like between you know like probably between you know 20 and 40 years old right yeah so there's no children or old people in this town that he took over okay here's a parallel i want you to consider wandavision there's a crazy person who's mind controlling an entire town to be his army where were the kids so he's telling the kids to hide out on the edge of town because he can't use them for his purposes here so he's mind controlling them to be out of the way yeah Okay. But they're they're out on the edge of town by a clothesline with a tear just dripping down their face. That's what's <laughs> going on with the kids. It is weird, though, that there's maybe 200 people in karate gear in this movie and not a single Asian person in the entire cast. That's true. They're, uh, our main cast is mostly all middle-aged white men. Yeah. I mean, that's South Africa for you. Chase talks Candy through the basic principles of martial arts, the gracefulness, the speed, and the potency. He throws a punch in her face and stops his fist an inch from her nose, but she doesn't react to this, which should have been a clue for him, I think. He begins chapter two on the element of surprise when she grabs his arm and flips him over her shoulder into the grass. The rest of the team bust up laughing as she wanders over to them and then kicks them all off their bench together because they're they're all wrapped around each other. So when she kicks one off, they domino the whole way down. Uh, I liked how Steve is describing like martial arts and what it means, but it's cross-cutting to Marduk also kind of talking about the same things. But I didn't understand why he's doing that because he's telling it to Minerva, who's not a fighter. Yeah. I think it was just establishing that they have similar ideals, I oh, guess. Oh, maybe, yeah. To show the parallels of the, the villain and the hero. Minerva informs Marduk that Operation Intercept is underway, which means that Steve Chase is here and they can prepare his champion for a fight. Minerva calls him by another nickname, Pumpkin Pie, and he reminds her that he doesn't like her using pet names in front of the other girls. Minerva is absolutely my favorite character in this She's wonderful. Film. She's yes. a lot of fun. She reminds me a lot of Brenda Vaccaro's character in Supergirl. <laughs> <laughs> she could have been played by Cindy Lauper. Oh, totally. If this movie had any money at all to work with. You must learn to stop calling me these names, Minerva. Oh, you're absolutely right, Chuckles. A parrot in the room finds this nickname particularly amusing. Chuckles, chuckles, ah, chuckles, chuckles, ah. Chase and his team roll up and park outside Wildwood Saloon and Bar. Inside, it's all American flags and banjo music, and I'm wondering where the hell this town is that Marduk took over. <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming that this is in the United States. Yeah, it would have to be in the United States. There's like there's a Confederate flag on the back wall of the place. Uh, th- this whole setup too, like, uh, uh, is very reminiscent to the plot of. Uh, Far Cry 5. Oh, okay. Uh, in which this cult has taken over a town and is using drugs to keep the population under control. Oh, okay. They had mind control potatoes too? Uh, no, they used really creepy like flowers that are the whole creepy, the whole theme of the game is like there's these moths because these flower, this particular flower is pollinated by moths instead of like bees. Huh. There's always like moths flying around. So does it's, it happen at night then, the pollination? I don't know. That's a good question. Aren't moths nocturnal? I don't know. Inside, they ask a grumpy bartender if he knows where to find Ironville. Hot Dog does his weird cigar trick again for no apparent reason. Okay, I looked it up. So apparently, 
uh, cigar smokers will dip their cigar ends into a liquor to moisten them so that the tobacco isn't dried out. Okay. But you don't need to do that, according to the internet, if you stored them properly. Idiots. I mean, hot dog just assumes that people a guy don't named store hot their dog stuff. isn't storing his cigars properly. Well, I'm but he shocked. Has, but but they're never his cigars. He oh, takes, that's true. <laughs> he takes them from other people. Yeah, he just he just has a very low opinion. You, of you other know people. what? I thought it was. Hmm. I thought it was he was sanitizing them in the yeah, alcohol. Yeah, but then it gives a bag. Yeah, well, but well, then you, you dip it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 up, it's up to them. <laughs> if you want my germs, you t- you take it. You dip, I dip, we dip. <laughs> Put your hand on my cigar. <laughs> Chase turns to the crowded bar and offers to buy a round, but a nearby cowboy hocks a loogie with such accuracy as to put out a candle right next to Chase. Why are there candles lit all over this? I don't know. Do they not bar? have electricity in town? Everyone who used to run the plant is now doing karate on the hills. <laughs> Chase extends his hand for Hot Dog to drop his nunchucks into. Chase rolls right into a weapons exhibition and swings the nunchucks fast enough to put out three more candles. The cowboy is so impressed that he offers to buy a drink. He approaches and then dumps the drink over the fly's head. When the cowboy approaches with a second drink, Chase kicks the glass out of his hand and it explodes. Do you remember the last time we had a glass explode in somebody's hand? No. No ninth configuration i think i mean uh stacy keach is squeezing the guy's fist around it until the glass finally shatters in his hand oh well that that doesn't count okay then earlier in this movie <laughs> when a beer bottle exploded in hot dog's hand does that count no okay the bartender reaches over the counter to put an arm around chase and the fly swings his foot around wildly kicking the regulars in the face A full-scale fight breaks out like in the bar from Firecracker earlier this season, and Chase's full team completely destroys the regulars. These don't seem like fully trained fighters, but they are. They're a part of Marduk's army. We Mm -hmm. just don't know that yet. Uh, I kept trying to watch what Gorilla was doing because I was like, is Gorilla ripping throats? Because (laughs) he keeps grabbing people by the throat and then throwing them to the ground. Yeah. I was like, I can't tell if he's just straight up strangling people to death. Or with one hand, which is amazing. Or if he's going for the turkey. Yeah. <laughs> gobble, gobble, gobble. Oh, God. Candy Cane is even pulling her own weight. Hot Dog doesn't seem trained in any martial art, so he's mostly pretending, and when people realize that he's pretending, they smash bottles over his head. Eventually, the team step over the bodies of the regulars on their way out of the demolished bar. The bartender manages to choke out directions to Ironville as they leave. I don't know why he did that. I guess they wanted him to. Yeah. So he does. Ironville, friends, isn't signposted. Just take the road into the mountains and you'll hit it. At the end of these instructions, the entire bar falls off the wall behind him and clocks him in the back of the head. In the camp, one of Marduk's guards catches an unauthorized man separate from his group. The man is not carrying a Class A permit, which is required for anyone sent on a special errand. The guard goes easy on him until Marduk interrupts. I'll let you go this time. No, you won't. Marduk informs the man that he will be disciplined accordingly, and obviously the guard will need to be punished as well. A second guard cracks him over the head with a blackjack, and he's informed that if this happens again, he will lose his elite status, and presumably his alive status. I don't know how much of this he's hearing, though, because he seems unconscious. Right, but isn't Marduk also, like, letting him off? Letting the guard off the hook here? Well, no, he punished him. He's letting him continue to be a guard. Yeah, what I'm saying is he's uh, he's letting him keep his elite status now. So he's right. basically doing the same things like, oh, I'll go easy on you this time. It's right. like, you're doing the same thing, man. It's okay when he does it. Minerva pulls up in a Jeep and tells Marduk that Chase and the boys and the girl have passed the saloon portion of their quiz. He tells Minerva to put everyone on high alert. Operation Water Supply begins in three days. Sure thing, dimples. He, he seems really upset, too, that the bar full of guys didn't succeed. Yeah. He's like, mm. like I, I thought I had him he, with that one. Yeah, <laughs> I thought for sure that my weakest ninjas would be able to stop him. But he wants this guy here. Right. He yeah. wants him to, he doesn't want him killed. We cut back to the team and Candy is washing her hair in the river. Chase compliments her performance in the fight. She apologizes to Chase for being able to fight and keeping it a secret, 
but it's obviously his own fault for assuming that she couldn't. It's not exactly the kind of question a guy asks a girl. He confesses that he actually finds her more attractive now, knowing that she's a trained fighter. They kiss, and the rest of the team start mocking them. They park their car on the side of a main road into the mountains and ask a passing vehicle for directions to Ironville. How about you stay on the road to the mountain like the last guy told you? The first car says that it's not called that anymore, and it's just a bunch of weirdos that live up there that you'd best stay away from. Chase keeps telling the man that he's more and more interested the more he's warned away from the town until the driver gets out to fight him. The man backhands Chase hard in the face. That's just a way of saying please. Chase elbows the guy in the clavicle and he drops like a sack of potato-based experimental drugs. That's just a way of saying thanks, but no thanks. More men pile out of the vehicle, all wearing the uniforms that indicate they're a part of Marduk's camp. They encircle our heroes and all start fighting simultaneously. As expected, they lose very quickly. Knocked to the ground at one point, Hot Dog empties the pocket full of tacks into the dirt, and hilariously they actually hurt someone when he steps on them. We see Chase jump up and grab a branch to spin around on, but the branch is clearly a metal pole planted in the ground with leaves in front of it. <laughs> Eventually, the fighters are all unconscious, except for Chase's team, who walk toward their new van to drive it to the camp. Hot Dog accidentally steps on his own tacks, <laughs> injuring himself. But then they don't take the van. I thought they were going to steal this van because they yeah. could look like they were a part of the right. team. You could, you could have stole all of these uniforms where nobody was going to notice you. Yeah. But you wait till later where it's more dangerous. Back at the camp, Marduk is apparently furious that his elite forces have been pulverized. But I thought the whole point was for Steve to face off with your champion. Why do you want him dead before he gets here? Minerva points this out. That the fight he's been waiting for is getting closer to fruition. Look at it this way, Popsicle. You're getting closer to seeing the Optimus destroy Steve Chase. That is, if you can overcome Operation Skydive. I know, I know, and don't call me Popsicle. Popsicle, Popsicle, Popsicle. I said don't call me Popsicle. I I love their relationship. I I, I hope that they are a like a power couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like or but I guess I guess it's supposed to be more like a open uh, relationship, or more like Lex Luthor and Miss Tessmacher. Sure, in yeah, Superman. But, but it is funny that she's allowed to make fun of him. Yeah, and she doesn't seem to be mind controlled. Right. We cut to Steve Chase meditating by the river, and he hears a voice, probably the voice of his master. Never let yourself forget the soul of karate. Character, effort, sincerity. Etiquette, self-control, maintain concentration at all times, looking deep into your own being. We see Gypsy and the Fly do a lot of fighting in unison with each other. They're clearly trained in martial arts in some way, because their form, to my unqualified eyes, looks very polished. We cut to an airplane dumping a bunch of men over the field where Chase and his team are playing cards. Presumably this is Operation Skydive. What a terrible approach to a battle. Mm -hmm. You have zero element of surprise <laughs> and the enemy has to watch you slowly descend from the sky for 20 minutes. I know. I don't understand why in these in every movie you're like, oh, there's people coming to attack us. Let's wait till they're ready. They've totally landed. Mm -hmm. They've gotten their parachutes off. They've all assembled together in one central location. Now we'll fight yeah. you. I guess that's the honorable way to yeah. do and it. And they got none of them brought guns because <laughs> all these people would be dead before they hit Just the ground. Mow them down. Well, and, and the first guy that they fight is exceptionally honorable because he and Steve like like kind of like bow and then they brace their arms against each other like like this is yeah. going to be a fight. Again, they find themselves surrounded by men in identical uniforms. Some are even armed this time with size, but it doesn't help their chances. The team continues to play cards while the Fly and Chase face off with the fighters. I was going to say, it's not the size that count. <laughs> Has is. that been used as a tagline on any of the Ninja Turtle posters? Like, oh, character man. posters? That'd be like, pretty risque. Size don't matter. Mm. That's size kind of it's kind of mean to uh, insert turtle name here who uses a sigh. You don't know? <laughs> I don't believe, I honestly don't believe you. You I, know who uses a sigh. I can identify colors and <laughs> oh, I can identify right. weapons. She's and officially in the first grade. She can identify <laughs> colors. I, I don't associate them with different weapons or colors. Like, I don't what, know. what about really? Michelangelo? What does Michelangelo use? Is he the red one? No. no. You thought you knew colors. 
No, I, I, I know that I know. Oh, you know what red looks like I when do. you see it. <laughs> no. You don't know which Ninja Turtle is that color. No, they're, they're, I just know that they're red, purple, I'm kind of yellow excited and for orange. where this is going. <laughs> yellow and orange? Shit. I don't fucking know. Apparently, oh I don't God. know colors. <laughs> what colors are they? You left out blue, the leader of the team. Michelangelo? The Mike, leader of the Michelangelo's team. Michelangelo's a You know the song, dude. at least, right? Donatello. You're, Raphael. You're, you're fucking with us. <laughs> you literally said all the wrong answers. <laughs> <laughs> forget which one's left michelangelo no i said that one already <laughs> i'll give you a clue he writes backwards da vinci yeah that's right <laughs> hot dog hucks nunchucks over his shoulder to chase chase disarms the dude using the size with his nunchucks which is why michelangelo would always beat Raphael. while these fight scenes seem technically accurate they're never especially interesting <laughs> It's usually just the same few moves over and over again, but they're, it's real karate moves. So if you care about karate, you'd probably find these fight scenes really interesting. I don't because I don't know karate. And so they just look like kind of lame fights. Well, and a lot of times I feel like they needed to trim like three or four frames off each edit because they'll cut to two guys about to fight and they're standing there for half a second too long before they start. Yeah. Yeah. Before they start throwing punches. They're like, no, no, you needed to. You need to trim a few frames so they're just yeah. they're already in the fight when you come back. Every shot starts with a guy going shun, <laughs> because <laughs> they didn't even bother to cut that. It's kind of like um, in uh, in Excalibur where we just let the camera roll for a little too yeah. long on these a little too accurate fights yeah. of people in armor. <laughs> At the end of every shot, all twelve actors are looking into the camera. <laughs> Did we get it? Are we, are we, should we no, keep going. Keep, keep going. going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> you just hear Borman in every shot. Chase is almost done with the entire squad of fighters and Gorilla and Hot Dog are still playing cards on the hood of the car. When one of the baddies is tossed over the hood, he knocks some of their cards to the floor, interrupting the game, and Gorilla is furious. Minerva tells Marduk that the fight with the skydivers is underway. Don't worry, Angel Face. We'll tie him up in knots. We cut back to the scene of the battle and the skydivers are all wrapped up in a parachute, kicking and shouting. But they're like inside the parachute, so they can't get out. Chase says that he saw where the plane headed after it dropped the men, and he knows which way the camp is. Yeah, it's right down the road. They told you. It's the straight road. Follow it. Also, you have satellite imagery of where it is. Yeah. You didn't bring a map? <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, this is before GPS, right? But I think they still had Dead Reckoning, because uh, they used Dead Reckoning in uh, Nothing But Trouble. Did they? Yeah, he had GPS in his car, but it wasn't true GPS. It was based on maps and Where you were last mileage. going. At, yeah. yeah. But... They could pull out like what a Thomas guide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's on. It's on page. B I thought they 17. had maps. Don't we show Thomas them pouring guide over for maps? The middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, this isn't even the middle of nowhere. This is like, this is outside of Dallas or something. I don't know where they are. Yeah, we don't know. They don't say. Hot dog is depressed that they're on their way again because he just won his first ever game without cheating, and now he has to cut it short. The plan now is to sneak into town covertly from uphill because they're they're in the rocks above the the camp and it would be a lot easier if hot dog wasn't wearing a fucking fluorescent orange shirt with the word hot dog printed across the middle of it <laughs> he looks like a fucking crossing guard i would expect nothing less from a man named hot dog chase says that they will infiltrate the camp two by two tonight first hot dog and gorilla go down then gypsy and the fly and lastly chase goes alone, alone <laughs> because candy is left behind as a lookout She's obviously not excited to be left out of her father's rescue. Chase advises his men to find a guard their size and to take his uniform to move freely about the camp. After sunset, we see a grappling hook come over a wall and Gypsy and the fly make their way in. Why? Yeah. They can levitate. Yeah. <laughs> well, Just hover from the top the of the hill. Can. Well, and one of them, clear, they both clearly are because the grappling hook comes up, but neither of them are holding the rope as they... Yeah, peek up over the wall. Yeah, it doesn't even get pulled taut. It's yeah, they, just resting on the top of the wall. <laughs> and then they just stand up from behind the wall and then jump over. <laughs> I was like, There's was clearly like, a ladder over there. Yeah, like it's it's not even a ladder. I guarantee you that it's wall is only two feet tall. On the other side, yeah. 
They're immediately spotted by a pair of guards and disarm them on the way to disrobing them. Oh, never mind. I guess they're ignoring Steve Chase's advice to dress as guards. They're like, we found two guards right away and we knocked them unconscious and then just walked past them. They, Don't they, you need costumes? But they knocked out dozens of people on the way here and yeah. didn't take their costumes. Also, costumes, uniforms. Same thing. Also, this assault of getting to the base takes them all night because it's day yeah. for the rest of this this yeah. hiding out. We see Steve Chase come flipping over a wall right between two guards when their backs are both turned. Hot Dog walks up to a gate posing as an arms dealer and a pair of guards just let him in. While Hot Dog pretends to unzip his backpack to show them the goods, Gorilla sneaks up behind them and cracks their heads together, knocking them out. He's an arms dealer who walked up to a gate like, with hey, a backpack. Hey, I got your stuff. <laughs> I got the Tamagotchis that Marduk ordered. <laughs> the next... Because, <laughs> you know, because you inject them. Right. You... <laughs> what? Tamagotchis were like, when they get sick, you could, uh, if they ever got sick, you had to give them medicine, but it was always in the form of an injection. So it was just like always, Marduk was just always Potato injecting juice. his Tamagotchis. He never had one. It was so sad. I'm sure that there's an app. Everybody else had one. They sucked because inevitably you would wake up the next morning and it was dead next to three piles of shit. And you're like, oh, good. I killed my Tamagotchi. And then you throw it away. Why are we talking about Tamagotchis? <laughs> you know you could reset them, right? <laughs> you didn't have to throw them away. <laughs> you throw them away the second they die. The next day, Marduk addresses his town over the loudspeakers. Attention, all citizens. Attention. Attention. The great, the immortal, the immortal Marduk, Marduk desires, desires to speak to you. My people, it has been a great disappointment to me of late to learn of a lessening in general productivity. It seems we are not using our work hours to maximum advantage. The reasons for this are unclear. But I cannot believe the problem is one of discipline or a lack of enthusiasm. Therefore, I have no choice but to increase the number of work hours and decrease recreational time. This is not a punishment, but rather a remedial measure. That is all. Why do they need recreational time? Yeah. They're how much, under mind control. How much recreational time do they have? Are they, are they like kicking back at the end of the day? Kicking, Just, kicking back and getting injections. I guess there were a lot of guys at, that, at the Wildwood bar. Is that where they go when they're not on duty? Like, does somebody tell them to do this do the guards be like now you must enjoy yourself go right. drink beers these are all orders steve chase sneaks up on an office of the camp where the mind control drug is being administered to people and it looks like the blue comb juice that you see at a barber shop yeah it's it's a chemical in these small blue vials and it's kind of a reverse ephemeral because instead of giving you the power to control other people it gives them the power to control you Unclear exactly how so far, other than just a general hypnotist's suggestibility. Yeah, like, I was going to say, now, how does this work? Because Why I, are they taking orders from one specific person? That, that, that's my question. Like, why is it the dude that's running the whole camp that's be able to give them orders? Because I thought it was supposed to be the person that injected them. But then, wouldn't it be anybody who talks to them? Yeah, you would so think. So couldn't Steve go up to him and be like, you're on our side now. Kill these guys. Maybe they just don't accept... Uh, commands that contradict each other so when they get the injection first they say you listen to marduk and marduk only but we don't see that happen yeah i'm just writing the script for them you just and then they better. also do like the three laws so they right. can't injure yeah. themselves <laughs> you are not allowed to allow harm to come to yourself unless harm is coming to marduk and you can protect him <laughs> yeah. with yourself and then you just get this crazy eye robot situation yeah and then will smith is like god damn it <laughs> That was the greatest Will Smith impression ever. <laughs> oh, damn damn it. It. <laughs> a car pulls up to a gas station at the camp and a worker is charged with filling the tank, but he seems to be suffering a seizure of some sort as he tries to pump the gas, which is a blue milky substance that must be what they're getting out of the potatoes. I've never seen a blue juice come out of potatoes or potatoes that were even vaguely blue. I don't think you're milking them correctly. I guess not. Uh, there are purple potatoes that are purple inside. That's true. Well, purple is a different color than blue. I thought That's you true. could recognize colors, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Which potato is purple? Donatello. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
It turns out that the man's drug is wearing off and the guard who pulled up to the pump requests an extra injection for the man to keep him on track. When the man tries to make a run for it, they blow a whistle and he's tackled to the ground by several guards before he gets his re-injection and calms down. Gypsy follows one of the guards into a porta potty and then beats the crap out of him inside. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a porta potty. I get it. I really wanted him to come out in the same clothes, but just covered in blood and still not have taken the uniform. Or shit. <laughs> <laughs> just covered in feces. <laughs> but instead, he comes out and I guess he put the uniform on over his own clothes because the guard is just ass naked in there. Well, he wasn't going to bother to redress the guard. <laughs> He's just very careful. He puts his own clothes on the guy. <laughs> but also, he doesn't lock. he doesn't lock it when he leaves, so the next person who has to go to the yeah, bathroom how inconsiderate it's okay the next person that steals a uniform just leaves a dude laying in the ground in the middle of a walkway that's true <laughs> <laughs> we cut across the camp to chase being stopped by security what are you doing here alien i belong to marduk's undercover force where are your documents i have them right here with the element of surprise, he karate chops the man's gun out of his hand, and the two men fight for a while until Chase knocks him out with kicks. No idea if he borrows the uniform yet, because we cut away to Gorilla and Hot Dog sneaking up on a pair of guards. I, I was expecting a moment where you see them clearly following guards that are their size, but that, that doesn't happen. They wait for one of the guards to bend over for some reason, and then Gorilla lifts the other guy by his neck completely out of frame up a spiral staircase. We see Chase in a guard uniform finally, heading to what looks like the camp kitchen. He hides around a corner and watches someone turn a knob entering the room, but when he moves to put the intruder in a headlock, he realizes that it's Candy Cane, having ignored his instructions to wait on the hillside. We see Gorilla and Hot Dog moving along in uniforms, and Gorilla is wearing such a tiny shirt that he has a bare midriff and the seams are tearing at the shoulders. It's actually a smaller shirt than what Hot Dog is wearing. Right? Yeah. Gorilla and Hot Dog meet up with Chase and Candy. Candy is now the only one wearing the clothes that she arrived in, and Hot Dog says that he better find her a uniform quick, which is technically code for, I'm going to go inside and tear the clothes off a woman. <laughs> Hot Dog peeks around the corner with a fucking boomerang <laughs> and throws it to take out a guard. Okay, Candy, here you go. Here's some clothes for you. And he just dumps like a dead guy in her lap. <laughs> yeah. What's the matter? They're too big for you. I'll get you another one. No, no, no. It's just just perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hot dog is so funny. This light had me cracking. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, hot dog. Candy, Chase, and Hot Dog walk along in uniform when a man behind them shouts for documents, but when they turn around, they see it's Gypsy and the Fly, also in uniform, making a joke. Amazingly, all the men seem completely invisible in these uniforms. When they're spotted by another guard, he's only confused because they have a woman with them. They claim to have caught her, and the new guard tries to interrogate her. What are you doing here, citizen? Obeying the wishes of the great and wise Marduk. The citizen acts strange. I think I should take you to see Dr. Kane for special examination. Rubbish! The guard moves around this group, inspecting everyone's faces very closely. They sure are letting this guy stay conscious for a long time. When Candy repeats that the doctor has been moved, the guard tells them exactly where Dr. Kane is being held, but then turns around to admit that he recognizes Chase as an alien, meaning that he's not a part of this settlement. I'm taking you there immediately. There's something wrong. You're right, alien. Something is wrong. I, I like that he says, Marduk doesn't pay you to think. I was like, does Marduk pay you? Yeah. Wait, <laughs> like, you yeah. guys are getting paid? The guard grabs his gun and claims that he's going to bring all five of them in by himself when he is finally struck by a chop from Gypsy and a kick from Chase and collapses. On the way to the doctor, Gorilla joins their formation. The whole group head upstairs to the building where they're holding the doctor. They're stopped on the stairs to the second floor and led back down to the captain and they find the man that they just knocked out. He orders six injections for the group. But before Chase can be injected, a hand blocks the path of the needle, and we see that Marduk has spared this group their injections. These aliens are not to be injected. I have far greater plans for Mr. Chase. Upon learning they've been granted immunity by Marduk, the whole team just starts beating the shit out of every other security guard in the room. More guards are summoned, and for some reason this brings an end to the fight instead of just more fuel. Marduk marches Steve Chase through a field of his fighters training. 
He tells Chase that they are his elite warriors, but they all look pretty pudgy to me. Yeah. If they're elite, I'm elite. These are to be the upper class. Those individuals superior in every way. Physically, intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally. The freedom of choice eliminated. We cut from that demonstration to what looks like a brewery? Marduk tells Chase that the new oral serum is being produced and ready for shipment all over the world. Marduk tells Chase that he will soon have the entire world at his command. Well, so again, this makes me question how the serum works. Like, did we, like, implant Marduk-specific elements into this thing? Yeah. Because otherwise, if everybody's just randomly drinking it, aren't they just going to listen to the first person they talk yeah. to forever? Yeah. It's like he's just <laughs> dropping a massive rohypnol in the ocean. It's ju- He just roofied the planet. But there, you need to give instructions to each person or else that's not useful. Yeah. We see barrels labeled New York and Moscow, indicating cities where the chemical will end up. He tells Chase about the Optimus, his champion fighter who he requires to be the best fighter in the world. Steve Chase asks what would happen if he refused to fight, and Marduk says that he would be put to death. He introduces Chase to Dr. Kane. Here, Marduk is referring to this town as New Babylonia. Chase can tell that Dr. Kane is drugged, but Kane is instructed to tell Chase that he's happy, and he does. I am very happy. Minerva drags the photographer spy into the room and informs Marduk that she caught her taking pictures of the serum vats. Marduk revokes the photographer's elite status and orders her immediate interrogation. Well, this is also another one of those expositional, like, redactions of, like, I always suspected that it was her. It's just like, always? Then again, why why did you let her in the room with all the chemicals? Yeah, exactly. Marduk closes them in here with the doctor so they can interrogate the photographer, but when they're alone together, Dr. Kane drops the act and starts speaking normally. You're not drugged? No. In my case, the drug wears off in two days. Marduk has no idea. But there's a guard in the room with them. Yeah. <laughs> also, if so you're still out of commission two out of every five days. Yeah. So if he asks you a question like, hey, are you? have you been under my power this whole time? He would have been like, no, I was... I, was, I had free will for three days. Mm-hmm. Depends which day he's asked. I guess. Chase tells the doctor that he's been paid by his daughter Candy to rescue him. That only presents one problem, Mr. Chase. What's that? My daughter is here. Already one of Marduk's victims. I was very excited. It was yeah. like, is it Minerva? It better be Minerva. <laughs> oh, I was hoping it was like one of the people that they killed for a costume. It's the parrot. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> So, as we've basically suspected from the beginning, Candy is not the daughter of Dr. Kane. The good news is that the doctor has developed an antidote to the formula and is ready to hand it off to Chase for mass production. Evidently, Operation Water Supply is already underway, and Chase now has 24 hours to dose the water supply with the antidote before it will be too late. And he hands the antidote to Steve Chase, and we never see it again for the rest of the movie. We never come back to putting this in the water supply to save everybody. So hopefully that happened. We cut to a large arena. Marduk is applauded as he enters, and he steps to a microphone to address the citizens of New Babylonia. There is a section of this, uh, like they pan across the audience, which is all people in like the the t-shirt guard uniform. Yeah. Except there's like one section of this place that's like, they aren't wearing shirts at all. Like, it's all these dudes, Mm -hmm. like, in this section that aren't wearing shirts. And I'm like, are those? The crew. Like, did they run out of t-shirts? They're like, well, we still need to fill the stands. Well, let's just... Let's just have these. This section be naked. Like yeah. I don't. <laughs> I, maybe they do shirts versus skins sometimes. Are those the fighters? I, I honestly, what I want it to be is that they just took the same group of people who had the shirts, had them take them off, and had them sit in different spots, so it looked like <laughs> more people. <laughs> that makes sense. Citizens of New Babylonia, today here we will witness that the Optimus is indeed the best. The, the best, best in the, in the entire, entire world. world. And what if Steve Chase wins dumpling? He will not win. We cut to the team in a jail cell, and even Gorilla can't break through the bars. Steve is led to the cell with everyone else and informs them that they will be forced to fight like gladiators. He also tells Candy that he met her father and that he's okay. 
At the end of his speech, though, Chase indicates that Miss Candy Cane might not be who she claims, and the guard comes to retrieve everyone but Chase. Chase's friends are placed in the ring one at a time to fight one-on-one -on -one with Marduk's champions. Gorilla fights with a man who I'm pretty sure we saw earlier in the parachute group. After Gorilla destroys the guy, he smashes him to the ground and pounds his chest. The next fight is Gypsy versus the guy who was driving the truck full of fighters, who promises that this time Gypsy won't be so lucky. The fight ends with Gypsy kicking the man unconscious. I don't think this is how Marduk intended this to go. Because Marduk is sexist, he forces a woman to fight Candy Cane, and it's the shortest fight so far. Candy lays the other girl out very quick. Why wasn't this... Minerva? Like... I mean, I guess she's above fighting, but yeah. it should have at least been someone who we've seen before, or better yet, the real daughter of the Oh, that doctor. would have been something. I, I feel like Minerva is is the is a different kind of hench. Like she she can pilot, you know, she can she can capably handle like errands and giving orders. Yeah. But uh fighting is not something that she does. I also don't think the pink hair is something they did for the movie. I think she has the pink hair regularly that the actress does we cut to hot dog in the ring with a fighter this should be interesting because hot dog doesn't seem to have any martial arts training he takes a lot of punches and kicks to the face ribs and neck and all he does in return is throw straight punches eventually he takes out his competitor with a series of punches and elbows next the fly faces off with another of marduk's fighters a lot of this fight seems to just be in fast forward that's the closest thing we get to a callback to any of the cool stuff we saw the fly do earlier but maybe they're just that good. Maybe maybe I'm imagining the fast forwarding. When the fly takes out his opponent, Chase's team has performed flawlessly. And not only that, it didn't look difficult for any of them. None of them yeah. came close to losing their fight. Although I guess Gorilla got over the thing where he bites people's ears off. I don't know why we didn't do that. They're making us look like idiots. Don't worry. Steve Chase has not yet met the Optimus. Marduk is weirdly certain that Optimus is going to win this fight. He tells Minerva that if Chase wins, that Chase will be killed, even though he's specifically looking for the strongest fighter in the world, and he has mind control serum. Why wouldn't you just make Chase the new fighter? Citizens, we will, we will now, now bring, bring on, on the, the leader, leader of these, of these aliens. aliens. The, the great, great Steve, Steve Chase, Chase who is going, going to, to battle, battle the, the Optimus. Optimus. Man, Marduk sure seems certain that the Optimus is going to win this one, they should call Marduk the Optimist. Uh. The Optimist is about a foot or so taller than Chase and surprisingly resilient, but there's not really a clear winner right away. Chase starts doing jumping flips over Optimus's head and punching him from above, and then he tears down the Optimist with a high spinning kick to the neck that seems to knock the man out. Chase's friends congratulate him on his victory that didn't even seem to test his abilities. Marduk is obviously furious. You're not Chase, I, I shall have, have the last, last laugh yet. yet. Chase announces that he is the Optimus, master of masters. Marduk informs Chase that he can't be granted the title of Optimus until he beats every one of his brainwashed foot soldiers, which is kind of fucked up because these are just normal people acting under the effects of a drug that was involuntarily administered to them. And he has to kill the entire town to become Optimus. And did the Optimus do that? Yeah. Chase is invited to try the first glass of a new liquid serum before the fight. If he doesn't drink it, Marduk will order the deaths of his entire team. But who here is going to kill them? They just beat the six strongest people. Chase chugs the glass anyway, and Marduk orders him to kill his friends. The team circle around Chase for a moment, and all punch him in the neck simultaneously. He collapses to the ground, and then they lift him up and toss him out of the arena into Marduk's lap. Chase puts Marduk in a headlock and orders him to free all of his people. He puts the microphone close so they can hear the order. You are our I, I, I am no longer your master. From today on, New Babylonia no longer exists. From today on, New Babylonia no longer exists. I am your enemy. No. I am your enemy. I am your enemy. You must destroy me. You must destroy me. Why would you agree to say this if you're going to die either way? Wouldn't you rather just have Chase snap your neck? Minerva tries to help Marduk escape, but the soldiers have gone crazy and chase him down. 
Chase's team escape the arena and board the gates behind him. So they barricade the innocent people who are under mind control drugs with the people with guns who are not under. So he's just basically doing what Marduk did. Yeah. He's just turning his those people into his own private army. Right, yeah. And at the expense of their lives. Marduk and Minerva make a run for their helicopter. Gorilla grabs onto the prop before they can take off. Minerva can't get the craft airborne and makes a run for it, crashing into candy around a corner. Back at the helicopter for some reason, some of the guards are still under Marduk's control. Like, I feel like everyone who's not under mind control drugs would have given up immediately when the, when the rest yeah. of the group was released. But they're still following his instructions and try to shoot at Gorilla so that he'll let go of the helicopter. But at the last second, he ducks out of the way and they shoot the helicopter, which explodes in a massive <laughs> ball of fire. The evil captain guy corners Dr. Kane, demanding the formula. Formula, Dr. Kane, or your life. Formula shall die with me. It's your choice. We get this awesome slow zoom shot of the captain raising a pistol toward the doctor. He cocks the gun and pulls the trigger, and we see super slow-mo footage of the bullet firing. And then we follow the bullet twisting through the air when suddenly Steve busts in with what looks like it's a it's like a laboratory clamp stand it's the thing you know that you would hook your bunts and burner you know holders on and stuff and the bottom plate is like thick yeah, enough metal that it would block up yeah because it's a big heavy steel plate and so it's that weighted your to hold chemicals aren't gonna fall over yeah. and, and stuff well he's holding that up as he jumps through the air and the bullet clangs off of it at first i thought it was supposed to be hitting his fingers too because the bullet is really close to his fingers on the thing but in the same jump He's tackling the captain to the floor, so he deflected the bullet and knocked the guy down. Chase lands on the floor where a foot and hand are extended to him, and he grabs both so the fly and gypsy can lift him to his feet. The doctor thanks the team for saving him and assures them that he destroyed the formula. Quote-unquote Candy Cane apologizes for lying about who she was. So you found out I'm a government agent? I suspected it all along. Who else could afford to pay me that much money for my services? She announces she's officially quitting working for the government, and he promises to keep her from changing her mind. Hot Dog shows up with his spoils from the battle, Marduk's parrot. Look at here. Got myself a lovebird. He's crazy about me. Got room for one more? Ah, popsicle kaport. Ah, ah, popsicle kaport. Chase asks if anybody else wants to drive for a change, and Gorilla volunteers. The car veers wildly down the road, and we hear it crash just out of frame, killing the whole team. <laughs> credits roll fuck the brass fuck the brass <laughs> <laughs> o'doyle rules o'doyle rules so okay so can we go back to the king king government thing like why is she quitting the government because she loves steve chase yeah. but why does he want her to quit the government because she loves steve chase i don't understand yeah <laughs> oh, uh, i think we i don't I think we kind of glossed over it too. Um, Steve Chase tries to give an ultimatum that if uh, they fail, that the government will bomb the facility. Yeah. Oh, right, and, right. and Marduk says, no, they don't. They want this. They want this uh, mind control drug as much as oh, I, I have it. So she, so she wasn't trying to stop Marduk as much as she was trying to get the formula for right. the government. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But I do think it's weird that at the beginning, she even specifically says, I, I want to get in there fast because I don't want the government to come in and do it. And it's like, but you are the government. Insanely, the climactic battle of the first film takes place in the exact same arena. And when Steve is forced to fight his fiance, as when he's forced to fight his friends at the end of this film, he instructs her to throw him out of the ring at the man forcing them to fight. So it's the exact same as this scene in the first movie. Right, but like he also has the opportunity. Like he's face to face with Marduk. Like before this even. Yeah, he could have like, killed him a bunch of times. Yeah, I don't understand why he was just waiting. <laughs> In the first film, he also ends the final fight with the enemy the exact same way by jumping over the big bad guy's head a bunch of times and punching down, and then a devastating neck kick. So they just basically remade the first movie as the second movie and then added some story yeah. elements i guess he needed marduk to I, he didn't unmind control these people no. he just he just he just mind controlled them differently yeah. right but after five days without injections 
they'll be back. But okay. there's also a whole vial of antidote in his pocket. So. Yeah. <laughs> and he has now less than 24 hours to get it delivered to a water supply. He was in jail. He was in a jail cell overnight. So if he puts that in just the water supply He just throws now, it in. Any glass of water counts as a water supply. We're good to go. And then no government can ever use this thing again because the water supply is already like vaccinated against it. Right. Okay. Unless, you know, people start working on a tomato-based fuel. But the energy Alt crisis. water. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't drink water anymore. That's controlled by Steve. <laughs> Wait, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, I like this movie. I think it was fun. I liked the team. Uh, I wish that there were more differences between them. It was stupid. <laughs> uh, I agree it was stupid, and I agree that I like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's... I, I, I think I wanted it to go more extreme one way or the other. I needed I either needed it to be like a hard ticket to to my well, hard ticket to Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. 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 I needed I either needed it to be like that crazy or be even goofier with with the comedy. Because them finishing a fight and then just like casually, solemnly stepping over all of these knocked out and possibly yeah. dead bodies was hilarious. Yeah. Like, the, but the, then I think they can't do that because they're all just townspeople. So it has to be clear that none of these people were permanently damaged in any yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said at the beginning, I wasn't sure when I started watching this film if it was supposed to be a parody or not. So I agree with you. I think it was amusing and it could have been more amusing yes but it wasn't good it was good um compared to most kung fu movies i think that there was more comedy in this which i always like from my movies um and the hot dog character kind of saves it for me i just really like the fact that they brought along this guy with no training and no expertise like they like uh, i think when the, when they're first recruiting him gorilla says something like his his bag of tricks like let's get hot dog in his bag of tricks to make it sound like he's a macgyver type and literally the only thing he does is like throw oh tax. for no reason they have tax on this airplane i'll take those and i'll throw them out on a battlefield when we're fighting later and somehow they're long enough to go through shoes and they're not even like they're not like tacks that you would use to pin something to a cork board they look like like brass tacks that you would use to like hold a script together that just they would fold over harmlessly if you stepped on them but he doesn't do anything else that's inventive or prop based yeah well he pretends to be an arms dealer with a backpack that's true i wanted him to throw one more gun and to just let it start firing somewhere in a room um but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the film. I think if there were a couple nude scenes and some real <laughs> gratuitous blood that this could have been, this would be a movie that people would talk about more often. I'd never heard about this before I found it for this list. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to give it a thumbs up. It was, it's not something I would recommend. I laughed at it, but I'm not going to tell anybody to watch it. I'm not giving it a thumbs up either, but I will say that I enjoyed it. Yeah, um, it's definitely not a thumbs up. Although it's, it, it could have been there. It, it could have been something that's so bad it's good, or something that was just. I really, really like how goofy this is. Um, it just, yeah, like I said, it just didn't get there. Yeah, all it needed for me to give it a thumbs up would have been either some consensual nudity or a really awesome kill, like an inventive awesome kill. And it didn't do either of those things. Um, do we know that where this is going letterboxed? I have it uh, higher than I expected. <laughs> not not that it's too high. But <laughs> Sixth place. No, 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 no. I just was thinking, oh, yeah, this will be at the bottom. But, you know, there's quite a few movies under it. Uh, I have it in 41st out of 59 uh, so do I. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, mine's below high risk and above back roads. Oh, man. I have it way higher than both of you guys. Really? I have it in 29th. Oh. Okay. Um, this puts it below King of the Mountain and above Charlie Chan. Well, you have all those horror films at the bottom of That's your true. list yeah. that are taking up so much room oh, that yeah, are def- definitely don't belong there. I have it between two horror films, but it is 41st also out of 59. Uh, 41st is just below graduation day and just above the nesting for me. 
Our director here was Ivan Hall. The only other title I recognized was Karate Killer, a.k.a. Kill or Be Killed, the first film. The writer was John Crowther, who also wrote the J. Lee Thompson, Charles Bronson film The Evil That Men Do, and he did the story for Missing in Action with Chuck Norris. The first editor, Robert Layton, his first editing credit was for Stunt Rock. He went on to cut The Sure Thing, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, Bull Durham, When Harry Met Sally, Misery, A Few Good Men, for which he was nominated for an Oscar, North, The American President, Ghosts of Mississippi, Best in Show, A Mighty Wind, The Bucket List, and Chef, amongst many others. The second editor, Peter Thornton, didn't recognize as much of his work, <laughs> but he did operate as the Director of Operations for the Phoenix <laughs> Foundation, from 1986 to 1992 when complications from glaucoma forced his retirement. <laughs> James Ryan played Steve Chase. For some reason, he's Steve Hunt in the first film. The beginning of the film's trailer introduces him as... It was Chase and Hunt? I, I didn't yes. Put those two yeah. together. <laughs> also, I didn't get to make my James Francis Ryan joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I've already made that joke on the podcast. So Wait, why, did, why did you make that joke? Did we have another? We didn't have another James Ryan movie, did we? Oh, it was a character last time. Yeah, it was Jimmy Ryan. Was that in? Uh, what movie was that in? Jimmy uh, Ryan. I don't remember. Okay, you don't have to look it up. Yeah. The beginning of the film's trailer introduces him as James Ryan, four times world martial arts champion. But as with Firecracker earlier this year, I couldn't corroborate that anywhere. I think people just never fact checked trailers at the time. Later, he shows up in Space Mutiny, The January Man, and From Dusk Till Dawn 2. Annalene Creel played Candy Kane. She did all her own stunts. She was Miss South Africa and later, as mentioned in the trailer, Miss World 1974, though I looked into it and technically she took second in the Miss World contest against a woman named Helen Morgan who was forced to resign four days later because she was an unwed mother with an 18-month-old son. It was not against the rules, nor was it kept secret, but tabloids made such a hoopla about it that the Miss World organization asked her to resign to spare them the embarrassment. What? What? Ridiculous. That's horrible. Creel also released a pop single the year this film hit theaters called He Took Off My Romeos. And it's just as great as you'd expect. You're what now? My Romeos. I don't get it. Michael Mayer played Marduk. Nothing else I recognized. Marlo Scott Wilson played Minerva. This was her first film. I didn't recognize anything else. But she also released a pop single called <laughs> Love Explosion. Yes, indeed, love explosion to stop this world from tearing apart. Oh, there's only one answer, can't you see? Only one way to set us free. It's a love attack. Bill Flynn played Hot Dog, didn't recognize anything else. Ken Gampu played Gorilla, he's the president in The Gods Must Be Crazy. He's also in King Solomon's Treasure and King Solomon's Mines. Yeah, uh, I, I, I recognized him immediately because I am a big fan of the Richard Chamberlain <laughs> King Solomon's Mines movie because it's so terrible. Yeah, well it's funny too because his name changes between the two films, uh, not unlike Steve Chase's. But the the other film is unrelated. Right, but, yeah. but it, the names both begin with with um yeah stan schmidt was the fly his credit in the first film is karateka he was the karate choreographer on this film norman robinson played gypsy billy he was another karate choreographer on this film and he was also credited as karateka in the first film as was eddie dory who plays optimus malcolm dorfman who plays the truck driver Derek geyer who plays rowdy and gordon richardson who played the waiter where was there a waiter in this movie? Yeah. Um, oh, maybe at the hotel? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he also, uh, Gordon Richardson, was the parson at the wedding in Tess. Those are all the credits I had. So I think that's everything for Kill and Kill Again. 
If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Secondhand Hearts, which IMDb describes like so. A high-spirited wife and her meekish husband hit the road to take back her kids from her previous marriage who live with her ex-in-laws. That is a run-on sentence. We leave you now with a trailer for Secondhand Hearts. This night and the night before Out, though. God damn it. You take bourbon, don't you, with the beard chaser.